commutation readings are made possible thanks to viewers like you. Please visit us at commutationconstruct.locals.com. Memberships are free to start with coupon code CCFREE. Hello and welcome back to Commutation Readings. Today we are going to be going through the final of the Federalist Papers concerning foreign force and influence. This is Federalist Paper number 5 by uh, Publius, John Publius J, I believe. So yeah, let's just hop on into it. All right. So same subject continue for the final time to the people of the state of New York. Queen Anne, in her letter to in her letter of the 1st July 1706 to the Scotch Parliament, made some observations on the importance of the union then forming between England and Scotland, which merit our attention. I shall present the public with one or two extracts from it. An entire and perfect union will be the solid foundation of lasting peace. It will secure your religion, liberty, and property, remove the animosities amongst yourselves, and the jealousies and differences betwixt our two kingdoms. It must increase your strength, riches, and trade, and by this union, the whole island, being joined in affection and free from all apprehensions of different interests, will be enabled to resist all its enemies. We most earnestly recommend to you calmness and unanimity in this great weight, great and weighty affair, that the union may be brought to a happy conclusion, being the only effectual way to secure and present and secure our present and future happiness, and disappoint the designs of our and your enemies, who will doubtless on this occasion use their utmost endeavors to prevent or delay this union. It was remarked in the preceding paper that weakness and division at home would invite dangers from abroad, and that nothing would tend more to secure us from them than union, strength, and good government within ourselves. This subject is copious and cannot easily be exhausted. The history of Great Britain is the one with which we are in general the best acquainted, and it gives us many useful lessons. We may profit by their experience without paying the price which it cost them. Although it seems obvious to come although it seems obvious to common sense that the people of such island should be but one nation, yet we find that they for ages divided into three, and that those three were almost constantly embroiled in quarrels and wars with one another, notwithstanding their true interest with respect to the continental nations was really the same, yet by the arts and policy and practices of those nations, their mutual jealousies were perpetually kept inflamed, and for a long series of years, they were far more inconvenient and troublesome, troublesome than they were useful and assisting to each other. So here we have an immediate uh, historical reference of how England themselves wanted to create a form of unity. There were claims of the benefits that uh, would would stem from unionizing the United Kingdom into a single a single entity a single government entity uh, that would lead them to prosperity and then a repetition of how that could be the case here how we would become more powerful by unionizing by by staying as one country one people. However, um, and, 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 or before I get to that, I should point out, he brings up how not doing this for so long had kept the British Isles, had kept Great Britain from becoming great for so long, uh, to put it in a, to put it in a funny way. Uh, but looking at this, there, there is one thing that I would like to point out 
is that uh, she does mention that while saying it will secure religion, liberty, and property, uh, it would also remove differences betwixt the two kingdoms. So I, I think that's a little funny because it brings them... Cl well, she's saying on one hand that it will preserve the what makes up the people of that nation. It will also conform the two nations to be more similar, to the two kingdoms to be more similar as one nation. So there, there, there's a bit of an irony there. Anyhow, I just want to point that out. I think it, I think it's, I, I'm not sure if that's uh, something to, to delve too deep into, but there is a question of do do independent agents want to join in a way where they and the people who may not necessarily be enemies but are not of their people become one people it is there that desire and is that necessarily for the betterment of uh of the individual cultural cultures that exist it seems to me that that the uk sought to create a single british great british culture whereas previously there had been uh, far more individualized cultures or what could even be seen as subcultures uh, if you consider the entire island the british culture so j j j just a little uh, thought I would point out. I, I, I don't know if it really means anything, but it, it's, it seemed worth uh, getting a thought out about that. Anyhow, we'll, we'll continue on now. Should the people of America divide themselves into three or four nations, would not the same thing happen? Would not similar jealousies arise and be in like manner cherished and set Instead of their being joined in affection and free from all apprehension in different interests, envy and jealousy would soon extinguish confidence and affection and a partial interest of each confederacy instead of the general interest of all Americans would be the only object of their policy and pursuits, hence the most, hence like most other bordering nations, they would always be either involved in disputes and war or live in the in the constant apprehension of them. So again, uh, they're going back to this argument of the U.S. is going to break down into three or four different nations. And this is just when we were 13 colonies. So we were just the 13 states or yeah, 13 states. We, we were we were no longer colonies at this point, but we were just. 13 states already breaking down into four different groups. That's less than four states per confederate country, confederacy. So that is, uh, it's an interesting perspective, but at the same point, would that be possible under the Articles of Confederation that created the original government? There, There is, a, there's a lot of questions about this as to whether this would have been what the alternative was is is the alternative that is being represented here is that what the actual alternative was or is it just or is that a ghost is is it as they put in anti-federalist papers is this just a phantom or are they arguing against the phantom because I believe that the Articles of Confederation, as they were, being a union of all the states, and we, and that did have measures to prevent states from lead, leaving the Confederation, would that have uh, would that have been any weaker against this type of division? Just a thought, just a, just, just something I, I want to put out there 
as a counter to what is being claimed here. Anyhow, continuing. The most sanguine advocates for three or four confederacies cannot reasonably suppose that they would long remain exactly on equal footing in point of strength, even if it was possible to form them so at first. But admitting that to be predictable, yet what human contrivance can secure the continuance of such equality, independent of those local circumstances which tend to beget an increased power in one part and to impede its progress in another, we must advert to the effects that we must avert to the effects that oh shoot, I lost my spot. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, we must avert to the effects that superior policy and good management, which would probably distinguish the government of one above the rest, and by which their relative equality in strength and consideration would be destroyed. For it cannot be presumed that the same degree of policy, prudence, and foresight would uniformly be observed by each of these confederacies for a long succession of years. So even if we were able to make them equal in strength, uh, the simple the simple facts of life are equality would not remain. Uh, the power, the both political, uh, militarily, economic, inadvert, inadvertently, no matter what, you, by not being one nation, individual uh, confederacies would grow in, into inequality. It almost, it feels like an argument that uh, being the confederacies, they would need to be, they would need equity more than equality, uh, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Uh, that That's why I kind of stumbled over reading the word equity equality because i was just like oh this sounds like equity to me um what he's describing because they're not getting the same outcome and they wouldn't they they definitely wouldn't this again against what he's arguing it is a good argument but is this a good argument against the articles of confederation which is the existing form of government at this time that is the question and still I want to bring this up because I feel that the case he makes is not a bad case. It just doesn't feel like it's it's delivered towards the proper purpose. It doesn't feel like it's delivered towards what it needs what it needs to be delivered towards. Continuing, whenever and from whatever causes it might happen and happen it would that any one of these nations or confederacies should rise on the scale of political importance much above the degree of her neighbors, that moment would lose neighbors, behold her with envy and with fear. Both those passions would lead them to, to countenance, if not to promote whatever might promise to diminish her importance, and would also restrain them from measures calculated in advance or even to secure her prosperity, much time would not be necessary to enable her to discern these unfriendly dispositions. She would soon begin not only to lose confidence in her neighbors, but also to feel a disposition equally unfavorable to them. Distrust naturally creates distrust, and by nothing is good will and kind conduct more speedily changed than by individual in invidious jealousies and uncandid imputations whether expressed or implied so i guess for an example say u.s say sorry u.s no say new york and pennsylvania uh and the virginias were one of these confederacies so i'm, I'm just throwing out a few places um say that those four states made up one of these confederacies based on perhaps the the way that growth ended up being uh the the northeast that part of the country being very uh industrial eventually over time uh you can see how there would be that that inequality and animosity growing heck e even under the constitution we did have the civil war we had and the North was more industrious. The South was more 
based on plantations and crops uh, and such. So that led to economic disparities. It led to differences in power and population density and all these different aspects. So I want to just point that out. He is not wrong about parts of the country being unequal, but even with the Constitution, we can see that 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 this that the Constitution did not prevent what he's talking about. So I I do find again this was a fine argument, but one it did not hold up. It did not prove to hold up over time, uh, to an extent at least. I mean we did reforge the Union from. Uh, the Confederate States of America separate, separating off. We reforced it into one union uh, by force. But th- there was that war. And, and again, would this have not been a similar case under the Articles of Confederation? Was, was the Constitution so much better than what the Articles of Confederation offered? There, there's a question. So let's continue. The North is generally the region of strength, and many locals... Sur- yeah, you know what? I should probably should just continue them before, because <laughs> they're going into it. The North is generally the region of strength, and many local circumstances render it probable that the most northern of the, pr- of the proposed confederacies would, at a period not very distant, be unquestionably more formidable than any of the others. No sooner would this become evident than the northern hive would excite the same ideas and sensations in the more southern parts of America, which it formerly did in the southern parts of Europe. Nor does it appear to be a rash conjecture that its young swarms might might often be tempted to gather honey in the more blooming fields and milder, milder air of their luxurious and more delicate neighbors." So they want to take, so the str- the strong states would want to take advantage of the benefits of the weaker ones, it, even if they weren't uh, part of one nation. So again, conflict. They who well consider the history of similar divisions and confederacies will find abundant reason to apprehend that those in co- in contemplation would, in no other sense, be neighbors than as they would be borderers, that they would neither love nor trust one another, but on the contrary, would be a prey to discord, jealousy, and mutual injuries. In short, that they would place us exactly in the situation in which some nations doubtless wish to see us, viz. formidable only to each other. Now, I find this funny uh, just coming from a modern perspective, because al- almost all animosity in the U.S. is turned towards different factions in the U.S. currently. Uh, given the modern political climate, it's it's very much Republican versus Democrat, conservatives ber- versus progressives, or whatever language people want to use for it. The, it's It's the Twitter battlefield, essentially, now. So the U.S. is very... Uh, formidable, uh, but culturally, uh, we're we're facing that formidab- uh, formidability only to each other. So, <laughs> I just find it kind of funny hearing this as, oh, the union is designed to keep us together, and over the long term, you can see how it breaks down. You can see how it breaks down even when forming the union in this way. Anyhow, continuing. From these considerations, it appears that those gentlemen are greatly mistaken who suppose that alliances offensive and defensive might be formed between those confederacies and would produce that combination and union of wills, of arms, and of resources which would be necessary to put and keep them in a formidable state of defense against foreign enemies." Yeah, so he's saying that the different confederacies would end up uh, forming, or it's a mistake to assume that 
the different confederacies would form alliances. But again, there is the question of why would we break down into multiple different confederacies? And maybe the talk was different at the time. And But if I'm looking at this as federalist versus anti-federalist, most of the, it seems to me that the anti-federalists were promoting the Articles of Confederation and not breaking up into many different uh, sub-confederations. So I, I'm not entirely sure who this argument is against. When did the independent states, into which Britain and Spain were formally divided, combine in such answers and unite their forces against a foreign enemy? The proposed confederacies will be distinct nations. Each of them would have its commerce with foreigners to regulate by distinct treaties, and as their productions and commodities are different and proper for different markets, so would the, those treaties be essentially different. Different commercial concerns must create different interests, and of course different degrees of political attachment to and connection with different foreign nations. Hence, it might and probably would happen that the foreign nation with whom with whom the Southern Confederacy might be at war would be the one with whom the Northern Confederacy would be the most desirous, desirous of preserving peace and friendship. An alliance uh, so contrary to their immediate interests would not therefore be easy to form, nor, if formed, would it be observed and fulfilled with perfect good faith. So conflicts of interest, again, among the divided confederacies of america nay it is far more probable that in america as in europe neighboring nations acting under the impulse of opposite interests and unfriendly passions would frequently be found taking different sides considering our di distance from europe it would be more natural for these confederacies to apprehend danger from one another than from distant nations, and therefore that each of them should be more desirous to guard against the others by the aid of foreign alliance than to guard against foreign dangers by alliance between themselves. And here, let us not forget how much more easy it is to receive foreign fleets into our ports and foreign armies into our country than it is to persuade or compel them to depart. How many conquests did the Romans and others make in the characters of allies? Yeah, characters of allies, and what innovations did they, under the same character, introduce into the governments of those who they pretended to protect? Let candid men judge, then, whether the division of America into any given number of independent sovereignties would tend to secure us against the hostilities and improper interference of foreign nations. So I think that's a strong ending for how foreign nations would be able to build up their strength and sort of create a position of power within a nation. Actually, the U.S. ended up doing something similar to this with Japan after World War II, where we essentially made them dissolve their army, and now we are the army for Japan. Uh, our, our military is the jet is the military that protects japan and their and uh, their country uh protects them we protect them from china and basically everything they have some military forces but in general they don't have a standing army the way the u.s does because of the treaties made after world war ii where we basically park our ships in J on the shores of japan and we're just we are there to protect them but really, uh, it does give us the ability to influence them in many ways. So, I, again, I, th I think for what he's arguing against, it's a very valid argument. But I'm not seeing the argument where the, where the Articles of Confederation, that the Articles of Confederation have, has no chance of sustaining itself, of falling apart, and of leading to, ultimately, this state of of uh separate sovereignties i i don't see the argument I, there is a skipped step in these first few federalist papers that does not consider how the articles are guaranteed to fall apart it simply makes the claims that it simply makes the claim that 
the Articles of Confederation will fall apart and the, na and the nation will fall into many sovereignties. But, so I am hoping to see future Federalist Papers uh, reapproach this and give more of a definitive argument against the Articles of Confederation themselves. But for now, uh, this is what we've got. And as I said, I like the arguments. I don't think they're bad. But they're skipping a step. Anyhow, uh, I know we did this one a little quick. Uh, I'm trying to get a little faster for you guys, so I'm not reading super slowly uh, all the time. But yeah, uh, what did you guys think? Uh, maybe you guys disagree with my analysis. Do you think that Publius is skipping a step like I feel? Or do you feel like this is a good argument for the adoption of the Constitution, even considering the Articles of Confederation. What, what do you guys think about this? I'd like to know any of your uh, thoughts and comments below. Uh, so leave something in the comments section. Be sure to give that like. If you like it, if you dislike it, you know what to do. And hit that subscribe, uh, subscribe button for more like this. Be sure to follow me uh, on YouTube, BitChute, uh, over at commutationconstruct.locals.com. You can also follow me on all of my social media uh, at Gap or Minds at James Darian or Twitter at Commutation C. Anyhow, all of those will be in the description below. So it's been great talking to you guys. I hope you like this one and I will see you next time. Have a good one.